uh, we are indeed in um, in very um, 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 bizarre times. Um, we are um, connecting from all over Europe uh, for this panel. I've got very distinct members of uh, um, uh, the private equity and venture capital industry with me uh, for this panel today. Um, I am uh, going to introduce uh, each of them very briefly because I presume you have um, the opportunity to access all the biographies uh, on the on the site and can um, and can um, get their background in greater detail. And we are going to make use of um, uh, the time that we have for this panel to uh, dwell into uh, into a number of uh, a number of um, more interesting topics than than our biographies, I guess. Uh, but just to briefly introduce you to the four uh, members that uh, I've got on the panel, uh, starting with. Um, um, uh, the lady uh, Ines Schreimelweger uh, is investment manager with Creandum. Um, uh, good morning. <laughs> um, good morning. And uh, she is she's she's splitting her time between uh, uh, Berlin and London. Has uh, a long indus industry experience with uh, several uh, venture firms in the past, um, and um, is um, um, in with Creandum, a technology, a major technology and venture capital firm in Europe, uh, and will share her experience with us uh, from that. Um, we have uh, with us also uh, Mark uh, Kashia. I hope I pronounced your name properly. Yes, thanks. <laughs> um, he has um, a, an industry that started at Wall Street and uh, it actually went uh, backwards engineered from Wall Street towards uh, more venture and even very specialized venture because um, He's a very um, uh, tech fine um, investment professional in the domain of blockchain, um, and uh, we are going to ensure your uh, your insights today from that perspective. We have um, uh, Ralf Günther with us, who is uh, with Pantheon, partner with Pantheon, and uh, um, uh, overlooking the activities and uh, business development uh, and also the secondary markets activities um, of Pantheon in the DAC region. Um, welcome uh, to this panel as well. Uh, thank you for joining us. And uh, finally, uh, I'd um, like to introduce uh, Lesek and uh, I excuse myself for not uh, pronouncing your surname because it will necessarily result in an offense. <laughs> Maybe you can, you can share that with us. Uh, um, later, but I would not manage to pronounce that properly, so I don't dare. Lesik, he is um, a um, um, is is partner with uh, Innova Capital in um, in Poland, and that, that's a, um, a private equity firm. Um, in this firm, um, Lesik is responsible um, for the um, uh, consumer good uh, and uh, um, and anything that is related to consumer businesses um, in the investment uh, focus of Innova. And that he's also overlooking the value creation uh, activities of the Innova portfolios. So, so thank you for being with us today and uh, joining us. Morning. Uh, uh, for, um, as a matter of introduction, I'd uh, like to a little bit frame the discussion that we are going to have because um, we had uh, um, a preparation call, uh, the, the four of us, as you normally have for those panels, in which um, um, we agreed that we would not prepare um, because um, we think that it's not um, so interesting for um, you as an audience if you hear the rehearsal of a kind of uh, state opera play. Uh, there are better opportunities in Vienna than a, a private equity conference uh, to do that. But we agreed that we would um, um, have a discussion about um, a few ways of looking at our industry and topics um, that are a little bit off stream, off mainstream. Um, and the reason for that is that um, I think we all have come um, by now to the conclusion that we are living in very um, uh, distinct times, that um, a lot of things have changed in our um, uh, daily lives over the last six months. And uh, many of them are basically um, bound to remain um, uh, for uh, the foreseeable future, if not forever. And uh, we thought that we would take this opportunity to reflect amongst us in a very informal but um, um, targeted discussion on what does that mean for the um, private equity and venture capital industry in which we are operating in? What is the role that we are playing in this changing society? And um, to what extent um, can we as an industry also be a catalyst in responding to the challenges that have been made aware uh, in the context of the current um, pandemic crisis and everything that goes with it? Because uh, 
um, we will come to the, also to the topic that um, the pandemic is not the only challenge that we are facing as a society and um, um, the private equity and venture capital industry is a role to play in dealing with that. So um, in order not to monopolize the time with introductions and framing of our discussion, I'd, um, I'd like to, to basically um, hit off uh, the, um, uh, the, the discussion and uh, and invite uh, my fellows on the on the panel to reflect for a second on um, um, the question of uh, if we look back at the past seven months, which basically have been starting with a relatively normal course of uh, uh, of the development of a year, and in March certainly flipped into basically from one day to the other into a um, situation where um, we have been in lockdown, locked up at home, locked up in terms of businesses, locked up in terms of supply chains and everything that, that goes with it. Uh, if we look back at those last seven months uh, from the perspective of our individual firms, what has changed for us? Is this just a situation that we are going to sit through? Is this something that we are watching go by? Is that something like the previous financial crisis in 2008, 2009, or the tech crash in 2000, where we think that we just can hold tight and um, um, by Christmas, this is going to be over and we are going to do the same thing as before. What's your view on that? Maybe Lesek, you could, um, you could have the first go, um, um, at that question from your perspective? I, I think it's a very difficult question to answer. Uh, if, in my view, there is a, there, there's a difference between this uh, crisis or this set of circumstances and, and the 2008 crisis. Uh, and I think the key difference is that the previous crisis was about money. It was a, it was a, a crisis about what we can afford and how we pay for it. I think this set of events is going to affect how people behave, what they do or what they don't do, uh, and, and certain choices and decisions uh, on uh, both everyday life and, and business life as well uh, will be dictated by strictly non-monetary considerations. So in that sense, I think, I think it's, a, it's a different crisis. Thank you. Um... Can you maybe um, explore a little bit what has changed in terms of the behavior of your firm in response to that? Is there, um, are you think doing things differently? Are you looking at deals differently? Are you, uh, are you looking at risks differently? Um, have your selection processes changed? What's, uh, what's your view on that? Sure. Uh, I think as, as, as you rightly said, the, the crisis came in uh, as a surprise. It kind of hit everyone not not out of nowhere, but you know, very rapidly, uh, the world around us has changed. Uh, businesses have gone into lockdown, and uh, you know, all the implications of that were instantly visible uh, in, in PNLs, um, also on the balance sheets in many cases. So the first few weeks, few months, uh, were I think across the industry uh, around protecting the businesses, protecting the people. Uh, thinking about value preservation, thinking about how to navigate through the storm waters. Um, I think, you know, it's easier to navigate through stormy waters when you have calm waters inside. Uh, I think at this moment, it's not quite clear uh, what's on the other side and, and when that other side might become visible. So I think that that, that adds to the difficulty. Uh, and, and then obviously the, the obvious question became, since we being a, a private equity firm, uh, we are pretty much forced to invest and disinvest all the time. Uh, the obvious question came around in this environment, what does one buy and, and for how much and what to do with uh, portfolio exits and uh, the liquidity that we need to secure uh, for our investors. Uh, and that obviously has dictated uh, a certain, certain uh, choices of uh, sector pri prioritization, uh, selection of assets within those sectors and an obvious, obvious set of questions came to mind. Uh, what does one look out for in this environment? How does COVID inform uh, the choices we make and the asset selections? Uh, what do we worry about now that we perhaps didn't worry about before? And, and there, were, there were some fairly obvious uh, factors. 
obviously the 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 question of how does covid imp impact the business short term uh, became a, a question about resilience of a given business model of a given market of a given customer base to a disruption like this one uh, both market uh, on the market side is the demand still there is the demand being satisfied in the same way through the same channels but also on the supply side uh, a lot of businesses that we've that we've seen uh, have had major disruptions in their in their supply chains due to the restrictions in international flow of goods uh, due to stoppages of production uh, due to certain lockdown processes that have extended uh, i mean fairly trivial problems like clearance times at borders for international shipment of goods has been extended significantly in certain cases uh, so so that has that has uh, obviously tested significantly uh, the efficiency and the resilience of those supplies uh, and, and these considerations have had both the short-term impact of how do we see the next three to six months, but also, and that's perhaps more on the, on the customer and market side, what does this mean for the next five years? Which industries will be irreversibly changed? Which customer behaviors uh, will have to adjust, not, not just in the short term, uh, but also for the foreseeable future? So, so yes, I mean, the short answer is we have changed how we think about assets. Uh, we have changed how we analyze uh, the outlook for uh, business models and for markets. Uh, but we have not stopped investing and we have not stopped trying to disinvest. Uh, in, in this year, we will probably close three new investments and we'll probably complete three exits. Uh, and it's not been easy, uh, but it's possible. I think the, the, the previous panel uh, discussed in detail how to do business uh, with investors in a time where people can't meet physically. Uh, I think it's also possible to do business with companies and acquire them and sell them uh, without or with very severely restricted ability to meet physically. Hmm. Thank you. And we're going to have the opportunity in the course of this panel to, to probe a little bit deeper into um, uh, what dynamics in business models have changed and, uh, and uh, um, what dynamics in value creation also in companies have changed. Um, uh, we're going to, we're going to, um, deal with that in, in, in a few moments. Um, but let us maybe swing to the other side of the uh, PEVC uh, uh, spectrum. And uh, maybe I'll, I'll pass the ball on to uh, uh, to um, Ines and, uh, and uh, like to uh, get a little bit of a view of um, what does it mean from the perspective of a venture capital investor to operate in this market environment? I think there's one dimension that possibly is different to a private equity setup that uh, in the venture space, portfolio companies do have the habit of operating with no revenues or little revenues and on a cash flow negative uh, basis because that's part of their business uh, development and growth. And uh, from that, possibly the shock has been, at least in the first instance, a little bit less. But um, yet we we need to re realize and recognize that we are in a situation where a few things um, that have hit us um, are bound to stay. And um, to what extent has that affected your view of the market and the way how you're conducting business? Yeah, I think a uh, very, very good and very interesting questions um, with many dimensions to it, right? I think for us, I mean, the crisis in general, the one thing we can all agree on is that we simply don't know right what's going to happen in terms of the health system and politics consumer spending behavior etc so what we at say as a firm but also within venture capital um do is we, we basically stick to business um as usual we meet with founders we invest as usual there's a lot of dry powder in the industry that still needs to be deployed funds are hiring we see more and more funds popping up so actually i at least personally feel like not not much has changed on that front um, but I agree, like when I think back in March and April, the first thing we did is when Corona locked us all up at home is we took a step back and reviewed the portfolio and we said, okay, what's the health of our portfolio companies and who do we think is going to be impacted the most and do they have enough runway? Um, but we've now seen over the last months that actually the companies, they seem to be okay. Companies are going back out for fundraising, like everything is, everything is resuming. The only thing, um, I would also say is that there are certain industries and business models that have probably already been struggling pre-corona um, and that has just been accelerated. A lot of companies in uh, travel and tourism, for example, are just, you know, 
it's tough times and we think this is probably still here to stay for another few few years. Thank you, Ines. Um, Mark, let me move on to you. You've uh, kind of a, um, a, a perspective that uh, looks at it with proximity from the sector perspective that you have in, in blockchain, which is a pretty peculiar and pretty specialized type of, um, of exposure. Um, how would you how would you reflect on the current situation? Is that something that has changed dynamics in, in, in your investment space? And, and if so, to what extent? Things have certainly changed um, in the way we conduct ourselves. You know, we don't travel nearly as much. Um, we don't meet people. There aren't meetups. And that's one of the things of the blockchain industry that was very common that there are a lot of conferences, a lot of meetings. It's not the same when they're virtual. You don't meet people face-to-face. Uh, -face. But in terms of the performance of our portfolio holdings, um, it's been amazingly good. I think our portfolio valuation has more than tripled um, since corona started. And it's not because of corona. It's just because of the stage they were <clears throat> when they come public and um, the stage of their development. And, and Corona has not impacted that whatsoever. These are digital assets um, and that live on the internet, if you will. And um, they support transactions and business over the internet and, and make things work better in a decentralized way. And if anything, um, decentralized things have shown resilience in, in the face of something like Corona. So you're dealing with a virtual world and the virtual world is unaffected from what's happening in the tangible world. I, I don't say it's, it's unaffected and, and, and you know, is, is it virtual? So where is this? This is a real conference right now, right? But it's held virtually. Yeah, it might be the new, the new tangible. <laughs> Uh, Ralph, um, I'm, uh, I'm turning to you. Um, you have um, you bring in a, a, another dimension uh, into that equation, which is the interface between the VC and private equity industry with uh, the uh, large investor community. And um, uh, you're a, you're a major operator in that uh, in that segment. Um, there has been a lot of fear aired in the market that. Um, uh, similar to previous crises, uh, what we're going through will lead to a major contraction to some behavior of panic amongst institutions and the like. Uh, um, is that something that you have been observing? What has changed for you in, in the last seven months? Well, that's a very broad question. Uh, <laughs> I think uh, uh, I'm happy to say that the things haven't changed that much. Uh, when, I, uh, when I think about our investors, uh, clients, uh, they are not in panic mode at all, um, and they keep investing in private markets uh, as they have been. Uh, and I think I like to think about long-term trends, and, and there's certainly one long-term trend which is uh, institutional investors uh, increasing allocations to private markets as much as uh, the interest rates are low and, and going lower. And this trend is fully intact. So we see that happening. And, and so from that end, people uh, uh, still not only allocate uh, to private markets, but uh, keep increasing allocation. Um, I think what has changed is, is the stuff that, that has been mentioned by my fellow panelists, like, OK, we work from home. We don't need, uh, as a global organization, we face some uh, some challenges because we depend also on internal travel a lot. Uh, we are a global partnership with 37 partners in, I think, seven different locations around the globe. Uh, and so you can do that for uh, for six or nine months, completely virtual video calls. But I think longer this goes on, the more it comes to light that there are indeed some disadvantages and some low lights uh, in this kind of uh, collaboration, if you want. Um, I also like to flag that, um, that this is not the first virus that has hit the world, and this isn't the first pandemic uh, that we have seen as a global firm and, and with a very strong uh, Asian team and, and Asia coverage. Uh, 
we uh, we have experienced uh, many uh, virus uh, and um, a very uh, very severe uh, incident with SARS and other things. So I think what is new is that this has hit uh, on such a scale the Western world and. Uh, I would personally think that we will adapt and, and we will uh, learn altogether to live with this virus and uh, the other virus bit further down the line. Mm. Thank you. Um, I mean, listening to um, to the four panelists, it almost seems that we could, if we took the easy way, conclude that we're doing the same thing as we did before, just a bit differently for the time that we are not allowed to do it the traditional way we've done. Uh, yet, I'd like to poke us a little bit uh, in, in this discussion and then possibly push us a bit further in our, our reflections on what may be the kind of more systemic changes that we're going through as a society and also as an industry that operates in interaction with the society. and. Uh, ideally, hopefully, also for the benefit of society, because uh, that's uh, something that uh, that ultimately will make the purpose of um, of our business activities uh, more meaningful. Um, uh, Ralph has said that it's not the first pandemic that we're living, and I actually like that uh, that parallel that he draws, because indeed we had pandemics in Europe um, something like 750 years ago that has been called the plague, I think, and. Um, I was actually um, reflecting in those uh, seven months where we have got a lot of time to reflect, um, as, as we all may realize, because we couldn't go anywhere. Uh, I was reflecting on how we were dealing with the plague 750 years ago and how we were dealing with um, the pandemic of COVID-19. And it struck me in a sense that uh, if you look at it, we, we have been basically dealing with, with, with it very much in the same way as we've been dealing with the plague. We have been trying to identify uh, individuals that were at risk or infected. We've been trying to isolate them. We have been trying to cut down interaction between um, humans in order to, to contain the spread. And we've been doing basically the same thing with COVID-19 with the only difference or major difference that uh, in doing so, we needed to take into account that today we are living in a much more interconnected world um, where, um, supply chains are global, where people travel globally, where uh, um, business, businesses are interconnected and interlinked in, um, in um, uh, value chains that are much more complex than 750 years ago. Um, and um, I was wondering whether we could not spend some time of our discussion here to reflect to uh, what is actually the role and what is potentially the opportunity for the venture capital and private equity industry to contribute to a society that is more resilient with respect to these um, um, uh, dimensions of dealing with uh, with a systemic shock like epidemic uh, of COVID-19. And uh, I'd like to play the ball maybe uh, to to Ines in the, in the first place. When we look at the at the debate that we had over um, the last few months in terms of uh, um, how do we deal with with uh, containing the spread and lockdowns and things like that. One of the major debates that we had was um, whether we should give uh, priority to protecting private data preservation and, and the intimacy of every individual in with respect to its interaction with society, or whether we should get, give priority to the preservation of the public good of health. And, uh, and uh, we were discussing uh, tracing apps and things like that, uh, whether they acceptable or not acceptable. It went up to um, even to the sub Supreme Court in some in various countries in, in Europe. And the question that I was asking myself, if you look at the wealth of technology that we are um, um, having already available today, do we really still have to choose between the two or can't we have both? Do we still have to know where somebody has been and who he has been meeting in order to understand whether that person could be the carrier of, uh, of a virus and uh, be dangerous for others to, to be infected or could we actually play on both uh, of those registers and um, and get the better of the two worlds so i think um I mean, I personally con contemplated for a while if I should download the app or not, and I'm based in Berlin, so for me it'll be the German version of the app versus the Austrian one. 
Um, I think, I mean, generally as a thesis, like if technology can help us to contain this pandemic, um, then I think we should look for it. And I agree that I think by now we should have reached the status where we feel comfortable and we have enough trust in the system that they keep they take good care of our data and that they don't misuse it. Um, and then on the other hand, I think people have been so free and willing to share their data with all the US companies that I wonder what makes the case so different with sharing the data with, let's say, the Austrian or the German government. Um, and maybe on a personal note, I'm, I might be a little bit uh, biased because I was part of the BCG Digital Ventures before I joined uh, Creandum, and they were actually a fundamental part in building the German Corona app. And kind of knowing the system, the checks, and the people behind it made me trust the technology more um, than if I were just an objective bystander. But it would be interesting to know here in the group, like who's actually using these apps. Uh, do we have the opportunity from the organizers to um, to make a probe in the audience um, who is using a tracing app, or is that uh, mission impossible for the technology setup here? We can do a quick show of hands within the panel here. Yes, who is using it? Who is using a tracing app? Uh, two. Well, I don't use one because Luxembourg doesn't have one. That's the problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but we are, we are such a small community that, uh, that actually analog tracing is still feasible in this country. <laughs> um, but interesting, interesting insights, Ines. Uh, maybe, maybe uh, Mark, you could comment from your perspective. I mean, you are working in, um, in a technology niche where everything is about uh, uh, securing data and, uh, and uh, making them um, uh, immune against any alteration that uh, that you can have. Uh, how do you reflect on the on on the potential of technology to uh, to equip us better to um, this type of systemic shocks that we are living through right now? Well, let me just first address trust in governments and systems. So I'm an American citizen, and and the U.S. government, you know, publicly or then privately but was exposed, spied on its citizens and listened to, the, to their phone calls and all this stuff, which was not, which is now recently, I think about a month ago, deemed not legal. So uh, one of the tenets of blockchain is, is, is to not trust third parties and to set up technologies in a way where it's not necessary to trust the third parties. And when you have this sort of trustless system, it's called, um, then you can do all kinds of things which you weren't able to do before. Um, and in Austria, you know, there was a, where, where I live, there was a, an, an app that they wanted people to use, but people refused because people care about privacy here. But the telecom companies shared location data anyway with the government. Um, so <laughs> it's like, so everybody got their contact trace de facto anyway. Um, yeah, so... One of the things we're working on, we're investing in, that our, our investments are doing, is identification on blockchain, so digital IDs. And, and this is for people, but it's also for assets. And it's one of the things that's gonna lead to the, a green revolution, um, you know, when decentralized solar panels can just, in, in a trustless way, in a, but a verified, and certified way, just plug into the electricity system. And you need an ID for that. Um, um, there are solutions uh, from one of our future portfolio companies, because we're in the process of launching a second fund. And I didn't mention that actually before, is that that's one of the things that where we're completely disrupted by Corona, because we couldn't go out to, to new LPs and say, hey, we have a great result in the first fund, now we're launching a second fund, do you want to hear about it? Well, it was kind of impossible, um, you know, when nobody knew what was going to happen and the, the global economy was, well, you know, GDP down 30% quarter, just made it impossible. So anyway, um, uh, digital IDs is, and, and having a proactive um, um, certification that is not linked to a personal identity is possible already. So somebody could have, um, uh, uh, via a blockchain solution, a certified uh, corona status, and, and they could 
give that to an airline, to uh, a building to get in, and, and it can be verified via blockchain. Now, this is not in production now, um, so it doesn't work, but it could work if it came into production and was accepted in different places. And do you think that uh, this pandemic is big enough, is severe enough, the impact is uh, huge enough that this will happen, that this will go into production? Or do you think that uh, the it's, next it's accelerating? Will be the so plague again? it's definitely accelerating the acceptance of this type of technology. So, um, from what I know, the the German government or the German Ministry of Energy and Economy is rolling out not not for health, but for energy an identification system, a digital identification system for renewable energy assets, for example. But it can apply to anything. So it just happens to apply uh, to this, but it can apply to people. It can apply to cars. It can apply to any anything you can imagine. You can extrapolate it to. Thank you. Lesek, um, let me turn to, to you now. Uh, you have been saying that um, you, you obviously look at uh, the kind of sensitivity of uh, business models to the current uh, uh, context, the economic context that has resulted from the, um, from the health crisis that we, that we have. Um, and that you adjust to that, but uh, in the context of that, you continue to buy assets and to sell assets and uh, life needs to go on basically yet um, I'd like to uh, to challenge you a bit on on the kind of um, uh, emerging and probably sustained trends that we are seeing also in consumer behavior and you said that um, within innova you're you're responsible for the um, for basically consumer businesses uh, and, and related industries uh, um, to what extent do you think that we are seeing that we are seeing emerging in this crisis a consumer behavior that is um, bound to stay and potentially to disrupt businesses that we've considered being safe pre the crisis and not being safe bets in the future anymore? Or in other words, what are the industries that you believe will be disrupted next because of what we're experiencing right now? I think you're on mute. Sorry, I, I think the distinction I would make is between uh, disruption and uh, kind of COVID related impact that relates from a change in behavior, not necessarily a, a new disruptive uh, technology or delivery channel. I, I think an obvious example of an, of, the, of, 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 of an industry that's been, I don't wanna say irreversibly, but certainly very significantly changed by by this is the whole travel industry and uh, i mean i haven't been on an airplane in seven months which is a fairly unusual situation uh, obviously i'm not an expert on air travel i'm not going to pretend to know what's going to happen uh, but but i think it's a fairly safe bet that it will take very many years for the frequency and volume of of air passengers uh, to return to where it was a year ago uh, so I think that's a, that's a very concrete example. I mean, people take holidays in different ways or not take them at all. Uh, traveling to your holiday destination by car within Europe certainly has become a lot more prevalent than it used to be. Uh, domestic uh, uh, domestic uh, holidays have become uh, all the rage apparently last summer. Uh, so I think you know that th those are very tangible examples of uh, customer choices or consumer choices that. Uh, I think for a while uh, will be will be changed uh, compared to where they were. I think there's other industries where uh, the, the, the the requirements of uh, of a COVID dominated world have been such that uh, change has accelerated. Uh, to to um, not not to look for examples very far e-commerce. Uh, if one looks at uh, what consumers used to expect from their favorite stores or favorite brands. Uh, a year ago in terms of online presence and ability to interact in an omnichannel model versus to what is the norm and expectation today, two very different worlds, right? And I think uh, a proper omnichannel strategy used to be something that differentiated a great business from a decent business. Uh, now, I think it's very difficult to function if you don't have one. 
So it kind of became a, a, a necessity for, for, for retail businesses to, to address uh, that need that has emerged. Um, and I think, you know, those are the, those are the things that, that we try and look out for. And obviously this is scenario playing. Uh, no one has a crystal ball. No one knows exactly how long it will take or, or what will happen. Uh, but I think asking those questions has become much more necessary now uh, because I think the last six months have shown us that a lot of the things that we used to believe about certain products or certain goods um, are not fully true or are not necessarily as true as they used to be uh, before, before COVID hit us. And if you reflect on the business models that are, if we look at beyond beyond the COVID impact, as you said, um, and uh, if we looked at um, trends that have already been there before that might have been accelerated, uh, also changes in consumer behavior in response to other societal challenges that we have, be it on the on the environmental front, be it on the um, social and demographic challenges that we are facing as a society, and uh, and consumer behavior responding to that. Uh, looking more at life cycle um, uh, rather than sales cycle uh, type of approaches uh, for, of companies. Is there anything that you see happening in your portfolio that uh, responds to that? Is that something that you see accelerating? I mean, I, I think there are, there are quite, a few, quite a few trends that have been already visible uh, that I think will live through COVID and perhaps, uh, perhaps even accelerate or, or strengthen. I think one example I would give is in, in, in foods and, and, and uh, consumables. There has been uh, a few years now a, a trend for more local, more artisan, uh, more genuine brands and products. People have been kind of, you know, redirecting their attention towards uh, locally sourced, towards more community sourced uh, type, uh, type goods. Uh, I think this will, uh, this will accelerate. Uh, I think awareness is, is, uh, is increasing. Uh, I think also the challenges in international or global supply chains that I've mentioned before may have made it easier for certain goods or services to be sourced locally. Um, and I think that gives them a, a comparative advantage uh, and less risk of disruption. So, uh, so I think those will, be, those will be on the rise. I think the whole um, notion of sharing versus owning or lease versus buy uh, will increase. I think the uncertainty that 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 has uh, we've all experienced in the last six months will continue to drive, especially in the younger demographic, uh, the behaviors away from uh, you know, owning assets and owning things, and more towards leasing or sharing them. Uh, and I think you know we all we all know the, the spectac spectacular examples of of uh, you know Airbnb or Uber. Uh, but I think there will be more and more uh, products and services that will be delivered uh, in this way. Let me turn to to, to Ralph and um, and explore that question a little bit from the um, interface with investors. Um, um, if we look at the broader societal dimension of um, uh, responsibility and assets manager managers having to live up to to value concepts of investors and the like um, and the entire debate on uh, to what extent uh, actually um, uh, strategies with respect to ESG uh, play a role in accessing investor communities uh, what is your view on that has that um, accelerated in the current context? Is that something that uh, your firm is acti actively looking at? Is that something that uh, enters your investment decision process? And in, if so, in, in, in what shape and form? Yeah, that's a good question. I think uh, one of the things I liked uh, in, in the debate here was that in many ways, I see the effect of this crisis as being the extension or acceleration of, of things that has happened and were in full motion already be it digitalization or, as you mentioned, ESG as a theme in investing, uh, becoming an ever uh, more important role. And, and to that extent, I like to say, uh, we have been on the forefront of implementing ESG aspects in, in all parts of the investment process uh, since, uh, I think, 2007, we started with that. And um, ESG is, is uh, implemented across the value chain, if you want, uh, within our firm. Now, uh, what has changed, I think, uh, is, is, uh, can be uh, examined from a sector. 
perspective and, and risk uh, uh, risk management perspective by sector. Uh, sectors always have been uh, one of the very few dimensions in, in which we have measured risk and there we have now seen some shift in particular in the infrastructure business uh, that are related to the of the uh, COVID-19 uh, pandemic, but also at the same time impacted by, by ESG considerations. And let me use maybe airports as an example. Airports have been seen as very stable infrastructure assets and as such had a very low sector risk rating. Now, this has dramatically changed and I don't see that this will uh, go back to where it has been before the pandemic. And then what makes it even more risky, I think, is all the ESG stuff that is now coming up that uh, at least leads to a, uh, to a mindset of travel less. Uh, and if people travel less, then uh, airports uh, carry much more risk than people thought maybe a year ago. Um, the other uh, example maybe uh, would be parking lots in inner cities. Uh, they used to be a very attractive investment for infrastructure investors. Now, um, this is an example where it's not such not that easy to figure out what, what this means. Uh, of course, you can say yeah, public transport and will, will be on the rise because of ESG and, and uh, uh, environmental considerations. On the other hand, now people do not want to use public transport because they are afraid they could be infected in a very overcrowded tube. So they might prefer actually to use their car. So how do you form a view about a, a, a reassessment of risk of parking lots or parking garages in inner cities? It's much more difficult to figure out. But I think uh, it is undeniable with or without COVID-19, ESG becomes more important in the investment process with end investors such as insurance companies and pension funds with middlemen like ourselves with gps and ultimately with management teams and leaders of individual companies you 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 referred to in in, in your reply to um ESG stuff coming up uh, and that that actually uh, motivates me to to ask you a question in how you see actually ESG concerns or values or um, ambitions of investors interfering with uh, with with the venture capital and private equity markets? Do you think this is still um, this ESG stuff is something like a burden in the process that you need to respond to in order to um, be uh, politically correct, or is it something that has moved into the sphere of an opportunity for in, for differentiation between? Uh, firms and investment managers and fund managers? No, I, I mean, we really think about uh, ESG as, as a part of risk management. So the better we become in managing ESG issues, um, let me put it that way, the better our companies will be and the higher the valuation will be. Um, or, I mean, uh, to, to turn that argument around, if a company or a fund manager has a bad ESG scoring or rating, uh, then there's probably a lot of stuff that not, needs to be reviewed, not only the ESG part of the business. And, um, and um, yeah, maybe I use this example because uh, it, it has been mentioned, uh, Uber uh, is a company that's a good example for digitalization, but also Uber is a, a good example for a company that will have uh, a very poor ESG rating uh, for all the things that have happened and for all the non-caring about uh, local regulation and so on. So uh, I think there are some very interesting uh, crossroads here. Thank you. Let me let me maybe uh, turn back to Mark at this stage. Uh, Mark, in in your um, in your intervention, the introduction, you mentioned something. Uh, uh, very, um, very pertinent, which is that uh, you're dealing with blockchain and working in the blockchain space um, as a um, matter of response to the absence of trust. Um, and that you that this is a technology that precisely lives from the uh, mistrust that uh, individuals have to governments, to public authorities, to, 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 to what have you out there. Um, yet, I think it's not an intuitive concept for um, um, 
uh, for all of us to say that rather than trusting a government, we should trust a computer or an algorithm. Um, because that is a fairly abstract concept in itself as well. And I'd like to poke you with um, um, with a kind of concrete uh, concrete example or concrete question to a situation um, when we talk about uh, blockchain technology and application. Um, because ultimately it questions um, uh, not only the relationship between us and uh, and public authorities and the like, but it it, it challenges also the the system that's the social system that we're living in. And uh, one of the of the of the references I'd like to make is uh, the reference to our legal system. Um, if we today have a dispute, um, I thought we had until fifteen. Um, so, um, 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 the, um, I just got a, a time warning, which was surprising me a bit. Um, I, um, yeah, looking at our legal system, le le legal system that basically relies on um, uh, a judge looking at a, at a kind of commercial transaction in from a perspective of being uh, um, uh, basically bringing together all the elements of uh, of a trade uh, transaction that has happened and then rule whether one or the other party is right. If we actually have that delegated to an algorithm that works in the concept of a blockchain, ultimately the only uh, party in the game that would have all the information available would be a computer. Do we have to delegate our legal jurisdiction jurisprudence to a computer, to an algorithm? Is that the future? Absolutely not when you put it that way, but if you would look at it through the frame of, and this is a trope that a lot of the developers in blockchain like to say that the code is law. So everything you can do with different types of transactions are encoded ex ante, so before, so it's hard to break the law via the blockchain. And of course, these need to um, harmonize with local regulations but we find that i think we all feel it as well that we live in a global society and and if you've read the book sapiens i, I highly highly recommend it it's that we tell ourselves stories that that things that nations exist and therefore they exist and um but the internet doesn't understand that and we can uh, communicate with someone uh, in our own countries and halfway across the world uh, just the same and we don't feel any difference like anybody listening to this right now could be could be anywhere and and so the whole concept of the nation state is is getting challenged but not by blockchain by by uh, what's happening in general but if we would get more specific and go back to, to blockchain there are a lot of things coming now that you'll hear about soon which um, are legal um, implementations f using blockchain and, and a bunch of law firms have signed up to, to work with this. And it does disintermediate a lot of rent seekers along the way. Um, uh, but that's one of the things that technology does anyway. And that opens up uh, opportunities for those who would otherwise not have an opportunity. So right now, if you wanted to start a business, depending on which jurisdiction you're in, it's it's very, very, it can be very cumbersome depending where you are. You have to go to notaries, you have to go to and get registered and all of these things. And soon will be a, a possible to establish legitimate businesses on the internet using blockchain technology. And this needs to be harmonized within the law because uh, we, you know, one of our, our tenets of what we do is that we do not invest in anything that challenges governments. We don't in invest in anything. So we have a so very socially responsible um, uh, way of investing that whatever we invest in should be for a, a public good or a good, let's say. And, and you know, my long career in investing, when I first heard about ESG, I thought it was more of, of a luxury that, okay, well, I can invest in things that make money or I can invest in ESG type things, but that's no longer the case. And, and that's opened once again uh, by different types of, of technology. 
Okay, thank you for that, Mark. Um, I, I get through my headphone uh, warnings about timing, so um, I'll, um, I'll I'll try to close that uh, maybe with uh, with a question to each of you. Um, but I, I ask you to be very short and brief. Um, but if you, as a person, as an individual, and totally dissociated from your respective firms, were given the opportunity to invest in one business model today in the context that we are in and with the insights that you're having from your specific uh, business perspective, what would be the company or the business model that you would invest in? Shall we start with uh, LASIC? You, LASIC, you, you seem to, to have reflected on it already. Yeah, I was praying silently that you don't ask me to go first. Um, <laughs> I think it's, it's an enormously hard question. Under pressure of time, I will say something to do with uh, securing and protecting personal data on the Internet. Okay. Ralph, how about you? Well, I would um, very uh, simply say a COVID-19 vaccine. Okay. Ines, what's your guess? I'd say um, a company that helps enable remote work with uh, contracts and people from anywhere in the world. Okay. So I think helping and you find a job kind of not related to, to nah. so moving away, um, like we said, um, from, from nation states to a more global organization. Okay, and Mark, I have the impression that you will come up with something around blockchain. Yeah, of course. I mean, I'm, I'm so deep into it that it's hard not to. Um, you know, when you couple technology and decentralization as a superpower that's very, very resilient against things like COVID and against a lot of things. Um, so it would be something in that space. And, and what I see, you know, very exciting right now around healthcare, uh, around health data, and also around renewable energy. Thank you and thank you all. With this, um, I'll, um, I'll try to close uh, our session so that uh, the technicians have the time to transit into the next uh, sessions of, the, of this um, online conference. Um, I think we have been reflecting on quite a few dimensions of uh, how our industry is affected by what happens, but also what our industry can give back to society in order to prepare ourselves better for dealing with this going forward. Um, thank you for all your insights uh, and to the audience, you hopefully have got uh, those valuable insights and an investment recommendation at the end of the panel, which you can execute on. Thank you very much. Uh, be safe, be healthy, and um, hopefully see you soon in reality one day. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, Willie. Bye.